Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to be starting our session now. We have two wonderful presentations. Uh, the first one is by my colleague, uh, Dr. Yu Song, and the second one is by my friend, John York, who's completing his PhD currently from UK. So without any further delay, I'll pass on the mic to you. All right, good afternoon, my three audiences. <laughs> Thank you for uh, being here. Uh, and my co-speaker, I guess. <laughs> uh, my name is Yue Sang. I am an assistant professor here at San Diego State University. Uh, I'm just kind of curious uh, how many of you here actually are doing research projects in the area of entrepreneurship? Okay, so for some of you, uh, just to give you some background, uh, because the reason why I asked this is this is a research project, so uh, the entire paper is uh, developed and most of the framing and the context uh, are targeted towards more of the research audience and also an academic journal. Uh, so some of the presentations I will do, you will see probably the framing and the way I construct things are a little bit different uh, than you know the entrepreneurship educator or like a person who runs the accelerator type of program. However, I'm kind of also curious, how many of you have, have heard about CubeSats, Cube Satellites? No? Okay, then you may know some novel technologies today, all right? Regardless of all the academic uh, definitions I'm gonna talk about. So anyways, the research project I'm going to uh, present today is called Ecosystem in Transition. And this is a paper that I have co-authored with uh, Professor Maggie Zhou, who is at University of Michigan, as well as Xiaoping Zhao, who is at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Let me start with some definitions over here. Because um, researchers, one thing we really like is about definitions, although I know at this conference you have heard about the word ecosystem and disrupt disruptive innovations probably in many, many different contexts. Uh, but uh, in order for us to write this research paper, we do want to more formally define it and also define our specific um, area that we want to focus on. So the way Though the word ecosystem has been widely used, the way we define it is it is about the alignment structure of the multilateral set of partners that need to interact in order for the focal value proposition to materialize. So the reason why the concept of ecosystem is so popular today is because companies are now becoming more interdependent. Uh, their performance is not just dependent on their own decision making, but also decision making of a lot, a lot of other organizations that that are not within their own firm boundary over here. Um, and uh, more specifically, in the ecosystem concept, you, although you have heard about this word, uh, but in the literature, there are many different streams about ecosystem. There can be entrepreneurial ecosystem, geographic ecosystem, business ecosystems. In this research project, we very specifically focus on what we call an innovation ecosystem, meaning the focus of our uh, research is on a specific innovation. and a set of actors, a set of complementary product and services need to be there in order to support the focal innovation here. Another concept we want to define is what we call disruptive innovation, and this is another buzzword that you will read a lot in the news and the media. However, in the academic literature from the early work of Clayton uh, Christensen, uh, a disruptive innovation is not anything that is new that can cause it some turbulence is a disruptive innovation. The way we define this disruptive innovation is it's an innovation that actually doesn't improve performance along the existing customer preference trajectory. Uh, however, it introduces a unique constellation of attributes. So usually, uh, in disrupting innovation, when first being introduced, it is oftentimes inferior in comparison to the existing technology. It is in the beginning oftentimes small, lightweighted, inexpensive, rugged, and uh, which are often led by new entrants while incumbents languish or fail. All right. So our research question, based on now knowing the definition, is traditionally uh, the literature, the discussions, the way academics have studied disruptive innovation 
competition is usually it's a competition between some incumbent companies. They ignored the disruptive innovation. Thus, later on, they are being replaced by the new entrants, by the new startups. Right. However, uh, what we emphasize in this paper is we try to bring the ecosystem perspective to disruptive innovation. So that what that means is when a new disruptive innovation is being introduced, it not only causes issues to the incumbent firms producing similar technologies, it causes issues to the entire existing ecosystem surrounding that incumbent technology. Uh, so one of the challenges for the disruptor, for the new company, for the startup is uh, in addition to disrupting the incumbent, it also needs to build a surrounding ecosystem um, near its own innovation uh, as well. And however, usually for startups, considering we just talk about the definition of disruptive innovation being inferior, small, lightweighted, rugged, it is really difficult for them to build an entire new ecosystem. And that is when, in this paper, we focus on a very specific time period that is uh, what we call a transitional ecosystem. So what that means is before a disruptor can build its own ecosystem, uh, a lot of times the disruptor needs to rely on uh, some of the supporting services being provided in the incumbent ecosystem over here. And um, uh, from that incumbent ecosystem, it, we identify a very important type of player, which is what we call the complementers. I know there are a lot of theoretical concepts around this so far, but let me give you an example. So what we mean by complementers are they are important players in the ecosystem that provide complementary products and services that contribute to to the focal offers value creation. Uh, the easy example is software is a complementer service to the hardware devices. Charging stations are complementers to the electric vehicles, right? So, um, incumbent complementers usually become the important bottleneck in the in introductory stages of a disruptive innovation, meaning the focal innovation is being introduced. However, there is a lack of complementary product or services over here. So. After all of those, uh, let me introduce you our research question, which is how do disruptive technology producers actually incentivize those incumbent complementers to serve the new technology, especially during this transitional ecosystem time period? They have to rely on the old um, uh, complementers over here. Uh, so this is our theoretical framework. As you can tell here, we are trying to highlight really uh, for the disruptor to work, not only they need to figure out their own technology, they also have you know, other players related, such as the disruptive complementer, the, the new customers. So this is the new ecosystem they want to build. However, there is also what we call the incumbent ecosystem with the incumbent technology producers. Uh, their incumbent customers Customers, as well as the bottleneck here, which, who are the incumbent complementers over here. Uh, so what we try to emphasize is there's competition not just between these two uh, type of players, but actually between these two entire ecosystems over here. And uh, we are trying to see how can we remove this complementer bottleneck. And uh, in this paper, we identify four different factors. T the first two being what we call the inhibitors. So the first two being barriers for the incumbent complementers to serve the disruptor. So why they do not want to serve the disruptors over here. And uh, one set of um, inhibitor we have identified is oftentimes uh, the incumbent complementer, the more they are co-specialized with the incumbent technology producer. So imagine if one of the software providers, their services are very much specialized to the incumbent hardware, right? They have invested a lot of specialized resources, human capitals to make sure the hardware and the incumbent softwares are interoperable, are compatible with each other. The more investment they have been made to the incumbent technology producers, the less likely they are going to serve the disruptor here. Right, because this is a resistance story over here. Does it make sense? All right. Uh, on the other hand, another um, 
inhibitor to stop them from serving the new customer is if they have high customer concentration uh, with the incumbent technology uh, customers, they are controlled by a few large customers. So it is really difficult for them to make the switch to actually serve the new small commerce over here. Uh, we also identify a set of factors that can actually encourage um, the complementers to serve the new technology. One is what we call technological standardization. So what that means is the disruptor can standardize their technology. So the complementers, they actually need to do very little adjustments to be able to serve the new technology over here. And also, uh, they can also use another strategy called you customer integration, meaning they themselves becomes the customers. So the complementers does not to go out and serve for the customers anymore. They themselves bring in revenue to the complementers already over here. Um, I know this is all very abstract so far, but let me introduce you to the research setting we are looking at. So we are examining, uh, you guys probably have read in the news about the emer emerging commercial flight industry, the emerging um, commercial space industry. So we focus on small satellite as the disruptive innovation over here. And this is the picture comparison of, this is the traditional large satellite of GPS-3, as you can tell by the size of the satellite over here, versus this is UO set one, and this is a picture uh, of the inventors of UO set one. Uh, the reason why we focus on small satellite as a disruptive innovation is it truly fits some of the key criteria of a disruptive innovation. Uh, small size, as you can see here, much lighter, right? Uh, also, performance in the beginning, at least a disruptive innovation needs to be inferior in comparison to the existing technology. So take Earth observation satellites as an example. Definitely the resolution from a small satellite is not as great, right? Uh, however, uh, by being small and lightweighted, the development cost is also much cheaper, right? Uh, you can see here the in comparison to the um, over $150 million development cost. Some of the CubeSats only cost you half a million dollar. And uh, many of the universities that you come from, probably their space and engineering programs have launched one of the CubeSats because how cheap they are. Um, and also the development time is much shorter. The launch cost, because they're lightweighted, they're small lightweight passengers, it's also much cheaper. And that's also why your university programs, uh, they are able to launch one of these CubeSats. So definitely many of the small satellites fits the criteria of a disruptive innovation. Um, and this is some of the data we put uh, demonstrating the total number of large, which is the incumbent technology, and small satellite launch by year over here. And uh, as you can see here, although 1981 is when the technology was first being invented, uh, the South takeoff of that technology didn't really happen until after um, 2015-ish. And more importantly, what we observe is um, during a long time period, the small satellite needs to rely on what we call incumbent complementers. And in this context, it is the uh, companies producing large rockets. So the ecosystem of a satellite is there's somebody who builds the satellite. And in order for the satellite to function and get to space, they need to be launched. Um, they need to be integrated onto a rocket. So the rocket companies are the complementers of these small satellites. And for many, many years, these small satellites are highly dependent on large rocket companies providing them a ride because uh, the, the dedicated, their own complementers, the small rockets have not been introduced and developed until 2017 over here. Uh, so we have many, many codes illustrating that, you know, the lack of launch services from those traditional rocket companies has been a very, very important bottleneck for the technology to be adopted because just no bank could fund a launch. There's very few. Uh, satellites are easy, cheap to build, but they just can't convince anybody to launch them. Uh, and uh, 
these are the samples we are looking at. Uh, the details, I don't think we have enough time to go into it. But essentially, we tracked a lot of uh, satellite launches, more than 25,000 of them. And uh, we tried to predict how many small satellites were able to be launched uh, in any given launches. And uh, we used the four factors. Um, we try to um, we use the four factors we talked about earlier to try to make that prediction. So we were looking at how those rocket companies, how much they have been co-specialized with large satellites, or how concentrated they are with their incumbent customers. And uh, for technological standardization, uh, we are looking at a small specific technology called the CubeSat technology being introduced. And we are looking at how this technology has actually enabled the satellites to be launch over here. Um, I mean, here are the regression tables. I'm sure nobody can read this. But in summary, we found support for our hypothesis over here. And we are hoping through this research project, we start to um, contribute to the literature by looking at innovation from a more broader ecosystem perspective and really trying to look into the interdependencies surrounding the introduction of focal innovation over here. Uh, that's it for my talk. If you think the same idea can be applied to different contexts, or if you have any questions about space or satellite, or we can discuss them later. Thank you. Now for something completely different. So um, my name is John York. Um, I teach at UC. I also am doing my doctorate over at Cranfield School of Management. And one of the courses I actually teach at UC is translational medicine. And one of the things that I found at Cranfield is, in our doctoral program, we have to think about how are we going to translate our research to practice. And I think that's a very important theme that we need to think about. This is actually a collaborative effort with my colleagues, being my supervisors over at Cranfield, and Grant Wilson, who Alex actually introduced me to, and we've had a very fruitful relationship. So start with why. Why do we need to translate? Why do we need to translate? What we need to translate is, is that the management literature has recognized that there's been this disconnect between research that's been done and actually application to practice, in management practice. And there's multiple papers that go back to the early 2000s, but also it's part of evidence-based management. So there has been a basis. I had a conversation just even more recently with um, Stern Neal up over at Cal Poly, and what he indicated was this is something that even at the schools we need to be thinking about in terms of the research that we're doing and how we apply it to practice. In particular, we need to think about this relative to entrepreneurship, which gets into thinking about the entrepreneurship space. Entrepreneurship is a practice-based space, but yet when you think about some of the literature that sits out there, there sometimes can be a disconnect. And you wonder, you read ETP and you're like, all right, how does this connect to my class? And so it's one of those things that some of our colleagues have recognized. And now I'm a lean startup business experimentation person, so I follow this literature very well. And Dean Shepard and Mark Gruber identified that there's this gap that exists. And so that became a stimulus to think about how can we be a better in terms of translating. I know in this paper at ATP that Dean and Mark put together a model and an agenda for research that would be engaging those in practice. So there's the punchline. So at Cranfield, we have an assignment where we have to basically follow a model in terms of taking and engaging our community and looking at how we're going to disseminate, exploit, evaluate. And we took it a little further step. We did a little research, getting some case studies, and we got some modification of that model. So as you can see, we have six steps starting from in the beginning of the research, bringing your stakeholders in, engaging them, and then looking at ways that you can disseminate out into the community, exploiting, and ultimately getting feedback, tracking metrics, and using what you learn to refresh and start the process all over again. So step one, stakeholder identification. Pretty straightforward, right? Well, believe it or not, 
you have to think about if we're doing research entrepreneurship, we should be working, and I'm sure several of you are working with folks in practice, but who are they, why, and what roles do they play? So two ways of looking at having a little advisory board and some ad hoc. I have several people who are part of my doctoral journey at UC. Dennis Abramsky, Tim Schwartz, they're folks that I get with get, to get feedback, get ideas about sourcing teams, and getting ideas in terms of how we can disseminate even the early work we're doing. Vanessa Scott is over at SIO, I work with her as well. Todd Hilton is one of our mentors, and he's been very helpful with that entrepreneur based in practice. John Fay is over at University of Michigan, he's already sourced me teams, and Marion Beister has always been that person who asks the hard questions. Because as if you know Marion Beister from Beister Foundation, you know, they've been entrepreneurs for many, many years. So when we think about our primary and our secondary, primary might be folks that you see on a regular basis, and secondary are gonna be folks that aren't ad hoc basis, you wanna engage them. All right, you just said, your advisor. Oh, great, well, what do you do with your advisors? And I think I wanna give some roles that they can play and some examples. So this comes out of the paper that we have that's going into Business Horizons, but there's some different roles that you can have your advisors play. First of all is when you're designing the research, have them ask questions. So when I do clinical research, we have clinicians come back and give feedback in terms of what might be good secondary endpoints. Whether a design's gonna be good relative to recruiting of subjects. We, so we have dialogue on methods, I asked them for brokering of teams, so I'm doing case study research. So part of my advisory group is, can I get folks from the i program, that's actually the sub subject that I'm looking at, so that I can investigate them. Um, progress, when I have data, so I've cut two cases already and summarized them in about five, six slides, and I sit down with them and get feedback. I'm doing this with some of the teams, I just did it with Dennis Abramsky last night really spectacular to get that type of feedback. And then you get ideas in terms of how do I disseminate? How do I exploit? So here's two quick cases. So Brian Baldessari, he's over in uh, Finland, and he does a lot of work in the sustainability space. And what I loved about this paper was is how he engaged three different stakeholders within the community, and it was the Climate KIC Initiative that was the, the, you know, the environmental stakeholder that was supporting this, but the research, which was called research and design, what he did was he engaged corporations, because they had a profit mode with buildings that they want to save energy, but they needed to engage as well the end user. So part of the research they got involved was the end user or employees. And so they used, as you can see, the bottom, Talk about talking, thinking, testing. Sounds like lean startup. First stage that we do in i -Corps, engaging your customers, engaging your partners to get feedback and ideas, co-creating. I thought that this was really a very good way of being able to build out a successful partnership to build a program that would fulfill everybody's expectations. Over in the UK, my supervisor, Steffi Hussels at the Bettany Center, she's working with all the big corporations for doing grand challenges, student groups, and research efforts, and getting these collaborative activities, and it feeds into their research that's there. Just last night, I had to leave this kind because my boss, Dennis, goes, I need to get with you because we had to create the sprint for next month. So I shared the data, and next thing you know, as you can see, we got this freaking whiteboard exercise going. Sharing of the data led to this brainstorming session and some ideas of how we could apply what we're learning to not only our education, but to future research efforts over at the Institute for Global Entrepreneurship. Do I have buy-in and support? Of course, because I bring in that stakeholder. So we get into the next phase, which is called share. Okay, so when you're doing your research, you should tell people about it. A meeting like this is a wonderful one. So there's three different ways we can do. Digital, okay, blogs are wonderful, 
your own website, emails, social media. I personally post a lot of my research on LinkedIn for people to be aware of what's going on. You can do it local, regional, national. Platform, what are we doing today? We can do it local, we can do it regional, we can do it in our school. Use the platform to share. I actually had a presentation prep to share my initial findings from a research for this meeting because I wanted to share and get feedback. Print, print, yeah, papers, but there's more than just papers. There are practitioner journals, there are books. I'll use the limits of lean startup because I've quoted that many times from Ted Ladd, but that came out of his Academy of Management paper that was there. So these are ways that you can disseminate your work so you build that engagement with the community, which leads to our next, which is called exploitation. And not in a bad way, but a good way to be able, how do I take it to the next level? So when we think about exploitation, Let's think about, we can do workshops, right? You have research, you have tools, you do workshops, you have books. We know several of our colleagues who've done the core research have produced books. I'll get a very good example. Websites, case studies. I do personally case studies. Actually, I did some research in Korea with some postdocs, and then we posted it, I got it published, and then we went over to um, Tal and Gruber because we're working on Market Opportunity Navigator, they put it on their website and their mailing list, we got 20,000 reach out of that. So this is a way that you could really exploit the work as well as getting policy impact, and like Steffi does that, or getting people like Steve Blank, and this was a, this was a boon for Gruber and Hall, put up on their website. So there are ways that we can think about how can we maximize the work that we're doing that can impact practice. I'm not gonna belabor, Every, who, who, who doesn't know this man? Okay, I just went through a class, three day master class with David Bland who worked with, did a great job. And this came out of, remember, it came out of his thesis in terms of the application and the tools. Who knows Nancy Balkan? Okay, what is she, she's pretty well known in Europe, right? For what? She is the leader in sustainability and circular economy and lean startup. And Nancy has done all her research. She's put work that she's doing on two websites. One on her personal, two on the Circular X, and people can go and get the resources. They have tools, presentations, papers, where the seminars they're doing. They're two tons of workshops. She's my resource for sustainability as we're building out our sustainability curricula. So here's a wonderful example of someone who now gets global reach, a name for sustainability. I'm glad there's somebody else besides me who knows about Nancy. So Peter Drucker, I think everybody knows Peter Drucker, right? What gets measured gets managed. So how do we do that? And how you do it is you go through the process as you start collecting documentation, okay? Could be emails, could be a journal. You could use uh, asynchronous feedback. You could use Slack, for instance, like we do in the i program, or we use uh, Basecamp. Transcribe notes from, your Otter, uh, from Otter, which is tied into your Zoom meetings, can give you documentation. And then what you can do is you can build out metrics that are quantitative in nature in terms of the numbers, but what's real, the real morsels are the qualitative feedback, the stakeholder feedback, the testimonies that you can use, the actions taken, and maybe the policy or curricula changes that are there. I'm getting that in two minutes, I'll finish it up. So refresh and refresh. This was Neil's contribution. Neil Turner is my supervisor. And I actually start re rinse and refresh from Julie Collins over at North Carolina State. So what that is all about that we have to think about is when we do the work that we're doing, that we're feeding it back into the system in terms of our research and our activity with our stakeholders. So I think who does it really well is Sharon Tal. I spent an hour and a half on the phone with her last um, June, interviewing her. And she thinks about the build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn, all the way through the process to improve the process. 
Neil, what Neil does is a part of his research and then he does his executive education work. He uses, to him, Neil's an expert in project management and he has, he's known for complexity theory and he has a complexity management tool. And so he feeds it into his research, he brings it into his executive education and then what happens is, is it feeds it into new research that's there. Which leads us to build, measure, learn but another theory or radical thing that we may need to think about, which comes from Mintzberg, which is we start with how we think it's gonna be, which is espoused, the espoused theory. But when we work with our community, we work with our stakeholders, we emerge into a better research product, a better research outcome because it's relevant to practice. And that we call translation. We have a paper that's going up to Business Horizons. We hope to get a favorable review. They got a little tougher these days. They're at, uh, I think, 11 impact factor. And my closing thought is you can bridge the divide, okay? But we have to work together. That requires partnership, cooperation, and collaboration. And my closing thought is we all need to give Alex a Big, big congratulations on 40 years. He's been in inspiration. I thank him for this opportunity to be on this platform. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yep. Thank you. I had a question for the first speaker. Um, so I saw that you didn't include the SpaceX launches in your, in your sample. Um, somehow, like, have you anyways investigated the role of this player in this uh, new transitioning ecosystem and the impact it had on the general ecosystem of, of the industry? And how did you take that into account? Yes, a uh, great question. Um, and I guess everyone saw in the new Thursday, SpaceX, their Starship, uh, although not successful launch, but still they celebrated it. So the reason why we excluded SpaceX in our sample is because um, we consider SpaceX as an outlier. What that means is uh, for, for research reasons, uh, multiple reasons. One is SpaceX is one of the, probably one of the only company in the entire uh, in the entire ecosystem we have observed that is completely vertically integrated in all areas of the ecosystem what that means is spacex visits um one, okay, with Starlink constellation, uh, SpaceX builds its own satellites, launches its own satellites, operates its own satellites. SpaceX does everything on its own. <laughs> and it's been bankrolled by Elon Musk. <laughs> so um, SpaceX, as a disruptor, does not face the same level of you know, bottleneck and resistance as other startups or disruptors in the industry. So that is one reason why we excluded SpaceX. The other reason is, although we stopped in 2017, but after 2017, especially in the past five years, SpaceX, that one company, accounted for more than 20% of the small satellites being launched. Uh, so they also... Um, basically causes uh, biases in our observations and sample as well. So that is another reason why we excluded them. A couple of observations, you. Uh, first of all, I think SpaceX has increased the capacity, right, significantly. And even though they launch their own things, they are, make their capacity available for others. So my, my son-in-law actually is in the space launch business. So he was a broker for space satellites. So what they do is... We should call him. Yeah, so they, they actually look at space launches all around the world. And a lot of the ones when they launch, there's a lot of excess capacity. And so they broker between people who want to launch CubeSats yep, yep. with ab available capacity. So SpaceX has really made a big change in the last five years because of the you know capacity. But the other observation was, you know, yeah, when I was thinking about this uh, disruptive innovation uh, in soft. I mean, if you look at both uh, the Microsoft as well as the Apple platform. There have been significant changes and transitions that have happened in the platform, which have been self-inflicted. So like when Microsoft went from 32-bit to 64-bit, or when uh, Apple went from their old iOS to the new one. 
and they required the same kind of disruptive collaboration and so on, but it was self-inflicted. And I just wonder, you know, as you're looking at this, whether that's another area where you can look at applying some of the same thought into what happened over there, because they had to drag along all the software developers onto the new platform, and you still had these entrenched intermediaries over there. So. OK, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I had a kind of, kind of a quick question. I apologize for coming in about five minutes late, so hopefully you didn't cover this. But uh, I'm at the uh, University of North Carolina, Wilmington, and uh, we uh, shot up a, uh, a CubeSat uh, a, just a couple years ago in marine biology and all that sort of thing. But we used uh, Russian uh -huh. uh, launches yes. yeah. uh, and because they were the cheapest, they were efficient, uh -huh. and you could, you know, I mean, they're, they're willing to work with us. Um, and so we do have it up there, and it's operating right, right now. Yeah. One of the... And so Russia has always been kind of one of the major players when it comes to the microsatellites. Yeah. What has the Ukraine-Russia thing oh. impacted this okay. whole process? Sure. <laughs> Although, yeah, I'm not, I won't try to claim myself as a space satellite expert at all because my background and training is more in business management. Uh, but I have, uh, it's another project me and my colleagues want to look into in the future because we do have data, like you were saying, on when, where is the satellite being manufactured versus where is the satellite being launched? And we are trying to look into the international collaboration. But coming back to your question, so it has definitely affected uh, the launch, um, the launch deals for sure. What I've read in the news, and this is just based on my limited knowledge as well. Yes, in the past, uh, the Russian rockets and the Indian rockets has provided a lot of launch opportunities uh, for the U.S. satellite, just because for the reason you are seeing, they're more accessible, they're cheaper, they launch more frequently. But because of the the, what's going on with Russia recently, there has been some pushes to the US government to regulate this more. And I think there are several scheduled launch on the Russian rockets uh, that has been canceled recently because of this regulation. Yeah, the Soyuz. Yeah, well, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, that, yeah, but that's definitely something interesting to be looking at. Okay. I was quite shocked about the amount of international collaboration in this there's industry. There's a huge amount. I mean, when, yeah. we, when we shot it off, it, it, it was collaboration between Scotland, uh, the UK, uh, you know, us, it's actually technically our satellite. We launched it from Russia. I mean, massive amount of international collaboration on this, but that was pre-Ukraine-Russia type of problem here, yeah, so. Yeah, and the entire industry came from the Cold War uh, satellites. The first one is the, from the Cold War be, between US and USSR. And later on, we do observe this collaboration now between US and Russia, so I was, quite surprised and yeah we are trying to look into why this is does it have any economic influence or why do how does international regulation like influences business level? but yeah it will be interesting to look into for sure yeah from a research standpoint yeah can i ask a question yeah, yeah. so uh first is are you going to use raj as a broker is it space flight industries? I think that's probably, is, there, is that the company you're some? Okay, yeah, because so, that's the broker, I know that's, yeah. They do amazing job, yeah. Raj is your first member of your network. <laughs> okay. Um, I do have a methodological question. Well, your question was a how question, was it? Um, my research question? Yeah. Uh, how do disruptors incentivize the incumbent complementers to so, the right services? You know, what we know from, um, um, at a standpoint, how questions tend to be related to theory building. You, mm -hmm. you see them in case studies and stuff. And yet I saw more of a positive approach here mm -hmm. in terms of testing hypotheses that's there. So I'm wondering if you might reframe that question or are you going to pull in uh, some qualitative data, sort of like a mixed methods type of thing to address that overall question? Uh, yes, we do want to, so this paper is still a working paper in development. Uh, right now the results you've seen are mostly based on quali quantitative uh, analysis. Uh, I have qualitative data as well. Uh, and um, so this, the, the industry context, and going back to your talk, the collaboration with industry people started when I was doing my dissertation and somehow I got involved with this industry, and then I started to attend and go to their industry conferences. Um, and the idea came from 
the interactions I've had with what we call industry practitioners <laughs> uh, because they were complaining so much about how they couldn't find a lunch on anything. Uh, and this is how we started this research project. So I do have more codes I need to go back and then code. And uh, we are hoping that we can use those codes to you know, answer your how the how questions, you know, explain the mechanisms of this is really the underlying reason why they do not want to launch us. And with the standardization and customer integration, this is how we actually make it easier. That, that would be wonderful. And it'd be from a contribution standpoint, because I didn't see the contributions, yeah. it would actually add to theory building as well, which would really actually put you at a higher tier journal uh, that's there. Yeah. So, and now you have more advisors in your network. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I had a question regarding uh, converting your research into practice. Uh, what are the biggest barriers that you have come across that is preventing like faculty from converting their research into practice or pushing the knowledge that they are creating to the practitioners community? Well, naturally the first thing is just time. That's that, you know, you think about a faculty member and how stretched they are. Uh, and then second is incentives. What is the incentive in many faculty members has been teaching publications. Publications there, service pace may not necessarily be as much in terms of that. And the fact that translation may not be picked up as much as a incentive within the overall structure within there. Uh, yet, you know, what's interesting is that framework, you could build out a working model where you could collect data and test hypotheses as well. Because that's something that Dennis and I talked about last night is using that and then using the metrics at the end that where it could be able to kick out some papers that talk about translation to practice. Yeah, and I do have a question for you guys. But I, I, I think that that is one of the big issues but that's why I'm a academician. Sure, because um, um, I think you can actually offer me some advice on this because I do try to, I, I already consider, my, consider myself in the academic world relatively more connected to the industry people because of the research context. Mm -hmm. But so far what I have been doing is because of the barriers you have been talking about incentive issues and what I do for my job is mostly publications. That's how they're gonna, you know, assess me and evaluate me based on the research part of it. So I've been using industry people as my data source, so to speak. Unfortunately, they're my samples, essentially. I collect data from them. And then, uh, and they love to participate. They love sharing their ideas. They love talking about satellites and you know what uh, challenges they have been experiencing. But then after the talk, like I sent them my written research paper and asked them for feedback, and they're kind of quieter now because you know the way we write papers and the way we structure things, the way we define things, the way we do analysis. I mean, I can basically tell the basic conclusion of my paper to them in less than five minutes and they have to sit there and read this 40 pages thing and <laughs> they're like, well, this is not entirely relevant to my specific company. I mean, I, I, I mean, sure, there will be some implications. And, so Baldridge yeah. paper, which was when I teed up this discussion, that was the paper on, I think it was the left-hand side, the far one, management paper. Yeah. That's you know, a number of years ago. Yeah. That is exactly what was there, was that management people love, it's all great science, but when you get to people who are in practice, mm -hmm. you know, they get different conclusions and then they think, how is this relevant that's there? But that gets to where you translate to taking some of your work maybe getting a piece like in Harvard Business Review or something like that and, you know, translating in a language that would be more relevant to the practitioner. Yeah, maybe someone else also has some ideas here. But one of the things is like uh, target audience itself, uh, like it might not, not be relevant to the inventors or the engineers who are working on small satellite, but maybe public policy makers, uh, it might be more relevant to that. So pushing your papers into those fears might be more insightful to you in terms of getting the feedback or in, even insightful to them to understand how this landscape is changing 
so th that, that would be my two cents. Uh, there. But does anyone uh, have any experience of sharing their research to practice here? Craig or Raj? I, you know, to be honest, I, I probably don't have, you know, when people talk about the application of research to practice, I would say, from my experience, it probably doesn't happen a whole lot. Um, where I have had more success is where I, you know, in my type of consulting, and my consulting is the valuation of businesses. That, that's what I do. Uh, that, that generates an interesting thing that I end up publishing on, and then it becomes useful for practice. So, you know, the, the consulting experience will create a problem that hasn't been researched yet. I'll do some research. I'll probably publish it in proceedings or something like that. Then it's picked up by practice. But, you know, the... The heavy-duty empirical type of research, I, I, from my own personal experience, I, I haven't seen it incorporated into practice a whole lot. In a way, in process, because when we're in practice, we're able to get the data, you're engaging people, and then you spun it into a paper, and then you refreshed it, because then you're probably using your research back with other clients to show that you are a credible source. Right, and it's establishing a standard, but what's interesting to me, and it's perhaps one of the problems of our field, is that the research that I'm doing out of that, which is being used now for court testimony, probably could not get published in a, in a high quality journal, just because of the nature. Because it's, you know, I'm not giving 20 pages of literature review in the front of it and all the sort of things that we tend to do. Um, you know, I think that a lot of the research that we publish, if we're talking about pretty high level, either empirical or theoretical research, you know, I, I just haven't seen it really incorporated into practice a whole lot. I mean, think of how many research publications are published every month and how much, you know, you could probably say is actually incorporated into practice. It's probably a very small yeah, percentage. I find it really fascinating because I work in the medical world. And the research always gets pulled back in the practice, ultimately. They're also, they're not 40-page papers. They tend to be 4,000, 4,500 words versus 10,000 words. Um, so it, I think that's an area that we all should strive to see if we can do a little better job. Because what we're doing research-wise at the end of the day should be able to impact, especially in an area like entrepreneurship, which is very practice-oriented. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, End of session now. Thank you again for participating, everyone. Thank you for your questions. Thank you.